Okay. What's that? There we go. Good. Um, what's the word? It was because my son's school, but at least this time they were calling saying we had to give him the permission slip. Can we go on this week? Yes, I emailed the teacher, but I guess you couldn't get through. So at least it's not sick. I also could call me when I'm teaching a bunch of classes. Hey, your son's sick. What was like? And today, of course, would be the day also when, when Isabel's got a class, and it would be impossible. And I have three classes in a row. Yes, it's Hell Day. Welcome to Hell Day. So. <laughs> um, we're that analysis. This is all stuff you know. You may not know it by this name, or, or you might. Uh, but doesn't that turn into the PowerPoint? Um, you can do a lot of again for the reason that you know these classes because there's, there's things that you do that would pass would pass the, the, the equations and the symbols and also I guess some of the other things that they teach us. Um. Okay, if you're going to find anything out about a data set, you have to first understand the data. One thing we're going to talk about this course a lot is getting a feel for the numbers, and getting an intuitive feel for the numbers that exist. While this is all theoretical stuff, we still have to get a feel for our numbers. So when you, and that's almost a subjective kind of thing, but when you get this kind of nice relationship almost to your data set, it's easy to find mistakes. Yeah. And that can actually be mistakes in coding. You know, a lot of times you're coding, you're putting numbers into a, a computer, and it's going to say our question mark. That's, that's a lot of us being coded. Or it could be something like, how long the hospital will say what words we're calling. It could be anything. Right? Unless we are directly having an EEG data recording into a computer to find it, which we very rarely are. Happens, but it's not common. It's just somebody having to code something in. We're going to make mistakes. We're bad at that too. We know that. Um, so that's one thing. So maybe you find something like, you know, it's a one to seven scale, and suddenly there's a 23 in there. Well, you shouldn't expect a 23, or even an 18. Um, it's also easy to find out what actually happened. What I, what I mean by that is, there's statistical significance, and we all know most of this course is about that. But there's also call it factor significance. So it might be the case, for example, that you don't find that there's, there's a point that's bigger than four or five million, especially like the modern things that are mostly in English. It's like, that's okay. Um, but what if there actually is a difference there? And it's got something to do with, for example, maybe you violated an assumption. Our shuttle would always say that statistics are there to, to, to confirm what we already know. So if we find a difference by looking at the data, we should be able to find that difference in the statistical test. If we don't, then there's something wrong. It's also easy to find odd values. Because we all make that mistake. Because sometimes it's, it's a coding mistake, and sometimes it's not. Like, think about, okay, one of the things that, um, a buddy of mine did way back in grad school. Um, he was our TA for our graduate staff, and he was interested in setting up a questionnaire sort of thing for students to determine how much time they spoke in class. Because when someone's quitting smoking, you wonder how much time they smoke. So, or, or, you know, just anything you want to know that. It was a really easy way to do it. There and it's to take uh, a blood sample as well. I said, well, what kind of a grade do you want? Wouldn't it be nice if you could give people five, four or five questions and you could get something as accurate as the saliva sample? 
So we collected data from 500 people um, at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto, and uh, which is a great place. People, it's a great place to collect data like that because people are into science. So they'll fill out, they'll, they'll fill out the questionnaires. They, that's great. So we got 500 smokers to fill this thing out. They actually invited him also to do the saliva sample, and he then built a regression model predicting. So he gave us the data set, which is what we call the Ontario Science Center. And we were to interpret it as having a regulatory data that was on this rather good-looking person. And there was a person who said they smoked 400 cigarettes a day. Now, that fell a coding. Probably literally the only one finding that. If you really suck hard enough cigarettes, you can probably finish it in like two weeks. Um, you can't really, you can't smoke a cigarette. Good <laughs> question. <laughs> it's like Screw the Olympic smoke, bro. Smoke more. Um, but like, if you can smoke one every two minutes, let's say five minutes. Smoker, one after the other, you're still pause and you're still smiling. So that's what one every five minutes is still pretty insane. So that's what uh, five minutes for a person one week per hour. Is that right? No, twelve weeks per hour. Twelve per hour. How how if you're if you're awake for let's say ten hours, you know, math easy. That's still not. That's why I code here. On the other hand, it was someone who said they started smoking at eight. That's how it like not eight o'clock, eight years old. And you might think at first back to the coding error, but if there are people who start smoking, they can be like that's possible. Maybe the person like maybe it's eight fifteen. Eight? It's not possible. You know, especially considering the brain work method we know from Stanford and Lee and you know that person that is seventy five years old. People did start smoking. So that's the kind of thing you could do back then. Um, kind of like your first, your first cup of coffee when you were getting there, or you know, play it into yourself. Just like your job. <laughs> so apparently, my dad lights up a cigarette and gives it to his mother to light. You know, it's great. It's going to stunt your growth of your mother's sweet quality. <laughs> In fact, the guy did start smoking when he was eight years old. It makes you wonder, though. In that case, maybe we remove that guy's data. Is he a standard smoker from today? No. Right. Or if someone said they smoked a hundred cigarettes a day, are they a standard smoker? Like, are they part of the regular, the general population of smokers? Where do you fit in? Can you make an argument for how many people smoke a day? So that's the kind of thing you do when you get this sort of feel for your numbers by, by basically calculating. Really simple discrepancy tables drawing pictures of the data. So, probably the most, probably almost the most important, and most certainly the most overlooked part of the system is exploratory data analysis, or EDA. Um, this was an idea that's developed by John Kinsey in his book, Exploratory Data Analysis. You know, which one did I get today? Um, <laughs> and really, all this is is calculating. I said discrepancy of distance and the drawing pictures from the scatter plot and some other things. Right? This is going to allow you to generate hypotheses and get this stuff into this feel for your data. So you can look at something like that and say, I could add another one. So that's all you're trying to do here. That's all you're trying to do. It's going to give us an idea, as I see here. How the experiment went, like what happened. It's not going to tell us anything significant. That's we're not there yet. That's 
later on. But it's going to tell us probably something more because we can look at, you know, graphs and stuff. But we're not going to lose the richness of the data. In other words, we're not going to lose the individual values. Once you put in a mean, once you start playing with means, you've lost a lot of resolution. Okay. Right? The mean describes the behavior. Jeff Skinner once said the mean describes the behavior of no man. don't want to always lose that resolution. Okay? Make sense? And remember, this is the first step that you're doing. Okay, I don't know what these are. I don't care what they are. We could, we could make something up. Let's pretend they're, let's see. They're, they're, they're scores on a test out of 35. So there's the x value and f is the frequency. You got one person got 10 out of 35. <laughs> it's pretty rough. 23 out of 35 is okay. This is a five. Uh, this is this would actually be a lot like you would expect on a sort of 21, 26 test number to be pretty good. <laughs> right? There's always there's a small percentage of cases. No, seriously, there are people that just don't get it, and they can't get it, and it's pretty bad. And then there are people that go like, is it hard? Why is this hard? Right? And then there's, you go, well, most people do it around here, and then, and then so this, yeah, let's pretend it's around here. Yeah. It's at a 35, it's a 10. Okay. That does not look like a good thing for this. This would not frighten me if I got these data back when I gave it to other people. I'd be actually pretty happy. 35 to 35, 5, 7, yeah, that's nice. I bet it beats the medium, that's good. Okay. So, what did I show you that for? Well, that allows us, I'm just going to use it as an example. So, there's a couple of things we can do. We can get a total, which is the sum of the x values times the frequencies. So, there's that. It's, uh, the sigma sign means the sum of. You know that, right? Remember that? It means add them all up. That's what that means. Okay? So we're adding up the x values and values times their frequencies. This is what's going to allow us to get things like the average mean. Okay? Don't worry about it. Remember, sigma is good. You know that. You can't be arguing. So you can also give it, we can use the, the relative frequency, the, the frequency mean, we can give it something called the relative frequency histogram. Um, okay, how did I do that? I don't know, computers. I put the numbers in, I think I used, I probably used the uh, Apple program numbers spreadsheet because it plays well with, 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 uh, with Keynote. So that's probably why I did it. You could do it with, with Docs, you could do it with Excel. CSS if you want to get crazy. But the thing is, I'm not going to ever, this is the kind of thing, I wouldn't be using this for presentation to people. I'm doing this for myself. And I do this whenever I give a test. You guys probably noticed that I always I use the averages, the mean is the standard deviation, which is a thing I do, because I want you to know um, what But also, I do it because I want to see how we did and see if there's something to miss. I have years of data on all the classes that I took. So I know if I've got a weak class or a strong class. So what I do is I look at my plot. Like, for example, I plot this thing three ways times. I figure, okay, that's not a good class. If you guys are three points below what I expect, that says something. I can get some sort of site grades, by the way. So I put size of data up, I put these up. I can get some down in averages down to about 0.1 or something like that. Or even more. So at least I have the data. Who knows? I've got a few rows. Maybe I get a minus one or something like that. So I 
would look at this and I would say, I mean, this is, all this is, it's just like, okay, so five people got 25. Remember that? I look at this. Do I have any concerns? Would you have any concerns looking at this? Anybody? Is there any, is this, does anyone see a miss at all? How do I do one of the rules of the game? No, I do. I wonder, is this person not doing well because they don't know what they're doing, or maybe they just aren't even really in the right class? Maybe they, maybe they got embarrassed and they got lost in their seat. <laughs> You ever done that? You ever got into a classroom and you get like not to read a test, but you just sit there and go, "Well, I got I've made my choice. I'm here now." <laughs> right? I did that first year. I was just like, "Aren't you scared of these people?" And it's scarier at a big school, but a small school. So I was at Western this year, and there's like thirty thousand students. I was like, "Man, I don't know if I can go." I thought it was going to be my high school class. I was like, "Oh, it's going to be a mess." <laughs> So maybe that, that person is not doing well. Maybe they just sit a lot. You know, what kinds of possibilities? But I would be concerned a little bit about that. But look at the rest of this. You got a nice the shape looks good, and again, have I lost any richness in the data? No, I can completely reconstruct what the numbers are. There's one, one person at 10, right? There's five people at 25, a set, one person at 35. I'm not caring a lot about the labels. I don't give a shit about that right now. This is not about, you know, you ever probably, at least in New York, you know, like that sexy pop book, Rio Limits, and all that. So I can look at it and get a feel for how big the numbers are. So I can reconstruct the data set. No problem. That's easy. So again, I, I do this whenever I have a test. I typically uh, with in Google Docs and I write it down in grid numbers. If possible, I could use files and just write down exceedingly. Um, but then, yeah, just use the grid to grab bigger and then you just use your chart to grab bigger and bigger. Well, I can spot a lot of these, like I said, maybe there's something wrong with this. Now, if it put this way, if I shift it over, all over here, I'd, I'll, I'd be concerned as well because more people failed, but I think this is probably this. The chance that the whole class is poor, it's more likely that I did a piss poor job or I wrote a bad test. Right? If everybody does poorly, in a, that's a pretty small sample, but if we had a big enough sample, like this, this size, okay? These guys were 20 odd yet. Um, if on the first test the average was 40, it, that's, there's something wrong. And it's unlikely it's your fault. It's possible, but it, it's more likely that I go to test, like I made up a test that was too hard, or I just didn't teach very well. It's possible, right? It's very unlikely that all of you guys So it was all shifted over, and then I'd be concerned, like, well, how did the one person get perfect? Did they do it wrong? This was so hard for everybody else. It was unlikely. Okay, so those are numbers. You can do with categories, you can get what's called, you can get a histogram, you don't get a histogram, but you get a bar graph. Um, you can also do a pie chart. I don't care. I hate pie charts. I, they don't do it. I, they look to me always like someone's, now let's look at so what the marketing boys are up to. <laughs> so I, I just, I don't, it doesn't do anything for me, but that's because it's, and personally, I don't care about it, but I do like pie charts if they help you envisage things. Um, wonderful. Because again, you're not, this is not something you're going in your paper. This is stuff that you are just collecting data so you can get a feel for stuff. So the x-axis, they're pretty much the same thing as an histogram, but the x-axis doesn't have a scale. Right? And how can it? So let's say this in an old stats class back when sociology and CSD came out, used to take that. Uh, they don't anymore. I don't know why. Uh, they got rid of it. But now we would replace that with biology because now it's just psychology and biology. It doesn't make financial sense. So the 
That's it. It looks like this. So there you go. Now look, this doesn't mean anything. Is sociology twice the the, 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 the program that psychology is? Not even close. close. Um, not the end, but it is understanding why it means what it means, right? It's completely meaningless. So the one advantage of this in the pie chart here is that it allows you to these things aren't completely meaningless. The order sometimes makes people think that, that there's still some value in that abstract view of the right. Again, this is not something you can completely deny on paper, so it doesn't really matter. I know that there's value in physical universe. I don't do it for fun. Right? I might do that for myself just to get a feel for, oh, look, there's mostly psychology, but if you put these two together, they all look the same, right? Now, of course, it's easier to find one. Just in some geography things, right? Yeah. Yeah, geography, if it's called geography, it's because it's supposed to be like the effect on physics and cosmology. I think they're all supposed to be the same. Now, quantitative variables, though, we have we, we use histogram. Quantitative variables are just variables that take place in time. Right? Again, that makes complete sense. Now, you got to be a little worried about that sometimes. I'm worried, but remember that just because there's a number doesn't mean the number actually exists. Because they could be categories that won't. Okay? Yeah, so these are just channels. The numbers of TV channels don't mean anything. Okay. So channel two, channel two on shock cable is uh, the weather channel, right? Channel three is uh, probably global. I don't even know. I think it was switched, actually, when they got it. I don't know. But the second one is, I don't know. I have my remote program that has little icons that says CNN, and I push that on my phone. I can see it from here. But is global which is three, and then the weather channel is two, is global one and a half times the TV channel as the weather channel? No. So sometimes numbers don't mean anything. Right? Is the class I teach after this class is psychology 4007. Hi. Hi. Hello, Mr. Gore. <laughs> um, it's like 4007. Is there, yes, that number doesn't mean anything, except the, the four probably means something. But the other numbers don't mean really anything other than they have to make you a kilogram for that number. Right? Like the six and the seven are pretty common, and the numbers are going to mean something other than they are really meaningful. Right? Because you can have three ones and your six is still not going to mean anything. Six hundred six is greater than three six seventeen. Isn't that weird? Three six hundred six is greater than three six seventeen. Isn't that weird? Because six means brain. <laughs> <laughs> so those are numbers, but they're just labels, right? They're just labels. So you got to keep that in mind, because um, you can't take averages of, of numbers that we well, can. The numbers don't know where they come from. Torture the data enough, it'll tell you anything. But um, the numbers, uh, like one old stat taught me in French two or three when I was in grad school, and it's going to be stupid to hold off because um, very influential in my career as far as how I view physics. Um, and he, he used to always say, um, the numbers don't really come from, he was Scottish, obviously. Um, actually, he's German, I can't do a Scottish accent. No, I'm kidding, of course, he was Scottish. He was Scottish, he was Slovakian. I know he's not dead. Um, maybe I don't think so. Anyway, that's what Thomas says. So, <laughs> so the numbers you, you could take averages of TV channels, it wouldn't mean anything. You could take averages of four channels, it wouldn't mean anything. But with numbers that are real quantitative variables, we can get central tendency, right? We can get spread, and we can get shape, shape of the distribution.
and get those three things. So we got the shape of distribution. We can make a skewness, right? So a negative skew, which is weird because I don't always look to me like it is fluid. It should be a that's a positive skew and that's a negative skew. Right? It's really weird. There's really, really wrong with that. There's, there's a, well, to me, my, my intuition is wrong. Does anybody else think that though, too? Yeah. <laughs> you all do? I mean, why do you do it? You feel that way? Okay, so that's good. Is that, Kale tells me that. <laughs> Pretty good. Cheryl told me that. I hadn't forgotten it since, so that's good. I mean, she told me that like two years ago. Before that, I'd always get confused. Like, what the heck is that? It was just like, I don't know what the shape is. I don't know what you're saying. Um, I want you to make skewness. Like, skewness is like this black. Actually, normal. It's 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 not uh, symmetric. It's it's over to one side. Right. It's biased in a direction. Probably the best way to put it. We can also talk about kurtosis. Kurtosis. I had that one. Pretty true. That patient now. But um, like, if something is leptokurtic, that means it's peaked. And if it's plantokurtic, it means it's flat. Can you measure this with numbers? Yeah, you can. I, I don't know how, but one could. I can't do it, but a man could. So it's possible to do it, but it doesn't matter. To me, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. If this was, of course, in a math department, they wouldn't have me teach it, first of all, probably. And secondly, they would care. I don't care. You will see sometimes when you put, if you go into a, a all the things we see for packages of PFS, or even a lot of the other stuff is super cool. You will see you can get a kurtosis number. I, that's fine. I just don't know how to interpret it. Like, I don't know if, if, it, is it, if it's seven, is that bad? I don't know. I really don't know. And I don't care. Because for our purpose, it doesn't matter. If, if, it, if it's useful to you, that's great. So you might want to say, oh, it's more or less peak. That's fine. So that's some stuff in the shape. Don't have to worry too much about that. Um, a distribution can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. So, on one or the other side, you have some difference or it's the same. Uh, it can be unimodal or bimodal. It has one mode or many modes, two modes. You might see unimodal distributions are pretty common, such as grades. I mean, that's a very common thing to see in, in the grade system. Uh, lots of overlap. I do see when I have taught. Uh, right away, this land, and uh, you can do that, I don't care. I never had to teach that before, so it's fine. It's fine, you have to do it. But, where was I going with that? <laughs> what is this random way to leave like that? Sass, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I used to teach uh, 20 by 26 before you came here. So, first test, you get it, you get this, you get a bimodal distribution. Totally, always. Because there's two kinds of people in the world. People that understand statistics and people who are frightened of them. The frightened tend to have a really modal experience. And then the okay people are okay. And eventually that goes away. It goes away for two reasons. The frightened people get less frightened, and a lot of them die. <laughs> so you start getting a unimodal distribution. But literally, I, I would always get a bimodal distribution. You see between one around 50 and one around 80. You don't see that typically. What that usually tells you is you have two underlying populations. And that's why I've said in that case, you've got one population that's like, they're not afraid of statistics, they get it, they're not afraid of numbers. And the other group is scared shitless. That's the two groups, right? 
and try to bring them together. But you really do, in that case, have two underlying populations. So very often, it is always the case that the two underlying populations are primal species, but it often is. Right? You should tell you something. You can also get a uniform distribution. Right? Where every possible value is a green and blue. When do we get those? Give me an example of when we get a uniform distribution. Think of something where every possible value is equally likely and equally frequent. But no, it's, it's, it's actually it's normal. Well, it's actually bimodal because we have to bring it in, but if we have either with or had yet, it's nice and easy. I mean, even though it's not very long. Just think about that kind of thing. This is going to be the same for all these things. Well, actually, probably two. We can do it as seven feet tall as are two feet tall. By the way, you know if you're if you are over seven feet tall, male in America, you're the last of the species, and it's only you. <laughs> that's, still, that's actually true. That's a real thing. It's still you. Can you give me a little bit? Sorry, Peter. <laughs> no, come on. Um, you got something to tell us? I doubt you get, I, you probably get a bias towards seven lucky numbers yeah. and a bias against 13. It's rolling a die, guys. Yeah, <laughs> right? You got one to six, or if you're one of those people, one to 20. Oh, you got to be a bunch of people getting one too much. Or, 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 what about flipping a coin? Right? Heads and tails. So you can get a uniform distribution. They're actually a lot more common than you think. It's, it's, it's not the kind of thing we think about statistically very often because it's kind of a mystery. Because the average coin flip is meaningless. It's ten and a half, and it's it's kind of it's one of those weird things. Now the the, the, the I mean the mean the mean the mean the, the uh, modes. Okay, here's an example. Um, I take the hockey example because I know a lot of hockey. So this is back, this is Mario Daniel who is, um, you know, do you think he's a Mario Daniel? It's okay, I can tell you who was. I think he's, he's an incredible hockey player. Now he's the owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He, um, yeah, there's one for, I mean, he's probably the best pure goal scorer in the history of hockey. He was an incredible hockey also the captain of our 2003 Olympic team. Oh, by the way, uh, he also, like, he had quit playing hockey because he had a bad back and he got cancer. Oh, one year he got cancer, was off for six weeks, and then came back. That's how good, an amazing an athlete he was. He got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so he was out for six weeks. Still won the NHL scoring title. He was an incredible hockey player, but his back got screwed up in college. He quit playing and then he came back. He quit playing, bought the team he played for. Well, he bought the team because they owed him a bunch of money, didn't have any money. He said, Well, maybe this just gives me a chance to do what I do. And then he came back, and the weird thing was all the players really worked for him. And he sold them to the Devils. Interesting. Um, so he was Incredible story, and he led us to the gold medal, our first one in, in real nine years, which is pretty cool. So here's the number of goals he scored in his career in eight years. So that's he was 18 years old. That's pretty incredible. Um, it seems a lot of funny things happen when you look at this. Like, what's going on? Why do they have 19 goals one year? That's odd, right? It's kind of surprising. Um, this 17 is because there was a, that's what he scored for the team. The 17 goals only scored here um, were scored there. The 35 here, no, this, this 17 I think is because there was a lockout in the season. There's no goalie for the three games longer. Um, that 
that's the cancer here. Seven gold. The king of the Tory could be for seven gold. Or you could be like, you just incredible lot of um, So then there's also like four years intervening here where he doesn't play. He just became the king. And he came back and got 28 goals in half a season. Um, his last year was 2005, 2006, when he played on the line with Rick Crosby. And he won the Stanley Cup. So he's, he's, he's an amazing player. So he's got a lot of respect. Okay, let's take a look at this. You probably want to group these down here. So we do a histogram, of course, but so let's just start with that. So that's just a midpoint. You can see it's funny because he's got a lot of years where he's got very few, and one crazy year. Well, it's actually not 90, it's 89. Does anyone remember what it was? So these are just the, these are just the midpoints. And it doesn't really matter. It just it gives us the idea that he's got a couple of pretty amazing years. Most often he scored a hundred and fifty, which is something that is the gold standard in hockey. So don't worry about that. There's the real limit stuff, it's not a big deal. The scale has to make some sense. So the x-axis scale has to make some sense, and there's no other way that could work, but it's the only thing that works on the high-axis scale. The y-axis scale is important, too. Now, let me take a look at this real quick. I'm going to put this here. I'm going to do a natural gas as well. Um, most people, when you like, heat their homes, there's no, there's no natural gas. Okay? There's no luck to getting any gas. Uh, there, is, there is no infrastructure for natural Steam oil, it's electric, or it's wood. And you need wood. So add seven hundred to that ratio. So it's pretty easy. So the um, the most expensive way typically, if I was a millionaire, would typically be oil. If you got any more, well, I would think that oil is not really that much better than natural gas anyway. So the electricity people were always trying to convince you. They sent out this tender, right? And everybody had an electric tender because they had blue lights. So they sent this little pamphlet out, and they're showing how much it costs to heat your home. So you can get the natural gas and the electricity. And they were just comparing electricity to oil. Oil went here, electricity went here. So, how does this work? Wow, that was pretty simple. And then when you look at the scale, you realize that it's just seven dollars more. And nobody spends that much money on that. Nobody spends that much money on that. But it makes a little bit of just a difference. Oil people went the other way. Anybody here see the oil in the air? Oh, it's weird. It's really weird. It's like this this purple shit. You guys can't see it. So the oil people prefer it because they get it from the Yankees. And it was great because it was the most both sides were doing this this second bullshit that did this. Electricity, infrared light, and power, that's what it was called, doing this. Well, I think there's another one that says that there. I don't think. They're both right, by the way, except see the axis here started at like two something, two hundred and something, and the increase was really small. It started to do it. But it was like really easy. <laughs> you can do it, it's easy to do. So you have to be careful. Now again, you wouldn't do this to yourself. You wouldn't want to do it yourself. But look out for that when you see data coming at you. And that can be data from a central oil campaign. That can be data uh, for almost anything. When people are trying to make money, one of the greatest places to go if you want to look at stuff where people, the data-driven stuff is a website called 538, and it's also 
Um, they do a tremendous job. They did written, written journalism. You know, they get people in, and it's you know, news stories, sports, economics, everything, and it's all driven by actual news and <coughs> not just projections. What do I think about sports? Politics, sports, and I think it's all in one place. So this isn't going to matter too much here for us because we wouldn't do that for ourselves. Um, the group that, of course, you lose some of the richness in the data as I talked about. So instead, you could do a stem and leaf plot, which is that, right? You know about stem and leaf plots? Sure. This is all stuff you learned in 2126, right? In fact, this is stuff you learned in high school. This is stuff you learned in elementary school, isn't it? You actually learned this in elementary school, which is great. It makes me so happy. It really, really, truly makes me happy. Instead of leaf plots. This is great. And I remember Maddie doing them uh, in Newfoundland in like grade five. I remember doing that story where she was working and she was just like, she was just like, that was tough. That was tough work. She had kids. And she was like, and, and, and I swore, I mean, Mark, I was so angry. Person got they got kicked from this test. The person who did well was awesome. And it pisses me off because it's like we just leave it all blank like that. You're not even trying. Like it, that makes me angry. The other ones where people tried really hard and I was fucking screw up, that makes me so happy. Right? Because it's like they're trying, they can like, it's not gonna be fine. So it pisses me off. So this is my guess. Kids learn most of their parents' attention from the movies and the TV. Right? And she comes in and she just just throws it off. She comes back 45 minutes later and she's like, Aunt, I think this is my fault. I said, Well, did it happen to this game? <laughs> she said, Yeah. So I said, Okay. So I go through, she doesn't do the test. She does definitions really well. Did the stem and leaf plot. Had trouble with the key test, which seemed like I had no idea what to do. Tried something, though, which was refreshing. <laughs> um, she tried some things. She tried the calculus. You're 11. <laughs> this person is 22. And it's actually taken the class, exactly, and is learning it in their native tongue. So it's great. You actually learn this stuff now, right? But if you don't know what this is, this is the stem. Yeah? These are the leaves. What a stupid name. Like, <laughs> I guess you call it something else. I don't know. But it's just like, it's almost like they're trying to be cute so people would like it. Right? So 1, 6, and 7, 17, 19, 28, 35, 43, 44, 45, 48, and then 49. This was an ordered seven leaf plot. So you could almost put an order within the, like, you know, the order. Yeah. I don't know why you do an unordered one. I have no clue why anybody would do that, but one could. You know, I'm sure the first one that was done was ordered, and then someone said, oh, I'm going to invent the other one. <laughs> right? They handed in their assignment and the guy says, This is wrong. No, it's, you've never heard of an unordered study leaf plot? Just pretend it's not. It's like, Yes, I don't think that's true. It's, yeah, it's a good story. Um, you interpret this like a history graph. You turn your head on the side and you go, Oh, yeah, it looks just like the graph. Right? And I see. I love seeing some of you do that. It always happens every year. Um, it's easy to spot outliers. <laughs> Are there any outliers here? It's hard to say. Like, that's weird. The one is odd. Like, he's got a few years here where he was, and I quote him, he was hurt a lot. He had trouble getting resources to his team. If he wasn't hurt so much, I bet he would have all the records and teaching records that he had. Um, or he's done a lot of teaching records. It's so great to see him break it down. Like, that was unbelievable. Like, that again, you know, 
the same And what they don't talk about is when two of that family come into my house and say, Can you come see us in our new dress and put on our new clothes? I'll show you how to talk to the place. And I think it's too short. Take it off. That's what all the whole family told me almost. It's more like 30 seconds saying thank you for all. So I told you you got hurt a lot, so at least that explains these strange numbers. Um, this is, these two are weird. Again, that's one of them is the year you get hurt. Another year is because it was in a lock. Yeah, this is the lockout year where it's, uh, that's where you hurt things. And this is the year where he came back after not having played for 30 years. And he looks like half a season. So it preserves the data, though. Assuming I transcribed those properly, which maybe I did. Doesn't matter. It's easy to spot the middle or the 50th percentile, which is 44. How many, how do I know that? Well, let's see how many numbers we have. Seventeen. So we're going to go in eight. We'll get a sixteen on either side, and then the one in the middle, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's the negative side. Okay. That means we get. Percentile, right? All scores, 50% of the scores are below it, and 50% are above it. Okay? Okay. Percentiles are actually pretty useful. Um, a lot of you guys have heard about, uh, and one, one of the things that actually will happen in this class is we'll talk about this is the place I get all the third year psych students together. At the day after the first test, there's probably a chemistry class in the class where I talk about what graduates are like, just to give you a notion. Um, I've done that every year. It works out pretty well. Usually, see if somebody else is in the hall or whatever. It's fine. Um, and one of the things that we're in graduate school is we have these graduate record exams, the GRE, right? Your actual raw scores don't matter. I don't know my raw scores. I literally don't know them. I know my percentile on them still. Because I, they say, how did you do in comparison to everyone who wrote the GRE that day? That's what matters. This is how tens and thousands of people write it. You always gotta hope that tens and thousands of stupid people write it in your day. Yeah. <laughs> it's not usually the case of dummy it's just people who read it. But somehow it feels like, well, I can just like stand up and say what I just wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, your your percent on that. Same thing I think with the SATs if you go to American uh, University you have to write the SATs. Right, which is also another scam, just like the GREs. <laughs> and PATS is the same way. They're all the same. Also, that's, your percentile matters. Your overall score doesn't matter a great deal. Okay. They've changed the scoring system. I remember it was funny because Dwayne said to Maddie, uh, if Maddie and somebody else write the scores, they're writing the GRE in English. And it's like, well, you need at least 150 for your score in math. And it's like, well, what's worth it? <laughs> I think it's like 20. And then I went and looked it up and said, I think it's actually 40. <laughs> They've changed it. So it's like, so, but, but the percentiles are matters, right? So 50% of it is actually a useful thing because it's the median. It's the score of, you know, below 50, below 50. If you want to look at how you do in a class, I've often said that you shouldn't give out grades, you should give out your percentile ranks. It's almost more, it's almost more reasonable. Um, a colleague of mine back in Newfoundland would, uh, give people their scores just as Z scores. And he would just give the standard deviation and the mean, post that on his door, and he'd tell people what their Z score was, just to make them do a Z test. Which I think is pretty funny. Um, so that's actually kind of a useful approach, right? You can also get what's called with that thing, five minute of summary. It's the median. The first and third quartiles, that's the median of the first half, 25th percentile. And it's going to be 17 and a half because we're going to go within that, right in the middle. Third quartile, 61 and a half, assuming I, again, assuming I did this correctly. Why do we get past that? Because we've got eight. Eight. So we've got to go in the middle of the third quartile. So 
the quartiles of the 25th and 70th orders. Absolute minimums, medians, and medians and maxima. That's the five number summary. The median, the first quartile, the third quartile, and the minimum and the maxima. And the, the, the difference between this and this, the first and third quartile, and the minimum and maximum difference, those can tell us a couple of things, a little bit about spread, about how spread out the numbers are. So yeah, minimum and maximum. That, that gives you what's called the range. The, uh, so then you take those five numbers, and these things may, they don't help you at all since they're boxes of number size. They don't help you at all. But some people like them. Again, I think some of them, a lot of that may be a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's a box of whisker cloth. Or a box, I like box plus a little bit better. I like that term because that's a little more uh, serious. More serious, like they got to throw whiskers in there. Like they, like they had a cat. <laughs> Some statistician with a freaking cat. So, look, everyone. So, what we got here is we got maximum, minimum. How did I do that? I can't remember. It was really complicated. You can actually, statistical software will do it for you nicely. So will, um, I, I did this with Excel, and it was so hard. You had to, I had to actually watch a YouTube video about how to do it. There's like 17 different steps to do this. But statistical software will do it for you easily. The nice thing is, there's so much free stuff online now that allows you to do things. There's statistical stuff online, uh, like web apps that do this stuff really easily. On um, this difference, distance here between the third quartile and the first quartile is called the interquartile distance, or the IQD. Okay. This is going to tell us something here. This tells us about spread. If, and the median, where the median is, which is in the box, tells us about skewness, doesn't it? About a whole lot of numbers, obviously, between 50 and 61, whatever. We get the same number of those as we have here. That tells us it's skewed. No, no, it's not. Okay. It's negatively skewed. Doesn't it? It's actually positively skewed. So I guess it's somewhat useful. I, I just never found that they were very meaningful to me. And again, that's just a personal thing. It doesn't matter. If you like these things, I suggest when you, those of you guys that are going to do a thesis next year, when you are taking a look at your data, use those. That's fine. If you're not, if it doesn't do anything for you, then you don't use them. Because again, I've never seen a box plot in a paper. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. I've certainly seen other systems. I've never seen a box plot. I've seen, I believe you can see that. Okay. a little bit, really one of the three properties that describe the distribution of scores, the distribution just are a data set, it's what's called a data set, it's not a batch of numbers, it's not what people call it. Um, so ten, central tendency was the median, for example, we also know it's the median and all that. Um, we can also talk about shape, that's that kurtosis and all that stuff. Kurtosis and meant something like that, so I have a legacy. Right? Broad Dex Law. <laughs> it's like when I tried to call the piece of gear that I designed and had in graduate school the Broad Deck Box. It's never caught on. <laughs> I only ever used it around friends. I didn't really put it in the paper. Right? My supervisor thought I was serious. So I was like, well, I'm not going to You know, even D.F. Skinner didn't call it a Skinner box. Somebody else didn't have to give that name. It was called the Opera box. Opera box. When you name an effect after yourself, it's kind of like giving yourself your own nickname. <laughs> you don't do that. You know, Costanza wants to be called T-Bone. You don't do that. All right. So, consider the following numbers. 1, 5, 9, 20, and 30. And 11, 
12, 13, 14, 15. Why am I giving you? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, both of these have the same meaning. The sum needs to go add to 65 and divide by 13. It's the same mean. Ah! But these batches of numbers are not the same. They're the same in one respect, but they have the same mean. The reason I'm telling you this is one of the points of this, I guess, is, is that the mean isn't the only thing that's important. And we get, it happens, I think, a lot to us in psychology. Well, in any kind of science where you're collecting data and talking about means a lot. So biology, psychology, this happens all the time. We seem to only care about means. And we don't consider the how spread out the numbers are often enough. Right? I mean, if I buy, think about this, if I had got an average of 25% in the plural third trimester. I would very much like to know. Because this is not the last question. Because <laughs> there's a chance. Me something else. It tells me everybody probably had a bad copy of the text and cheated. Right? It tells me that the, 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 the fake copy of the list of answers that I, I surreptitiously circulated <laughs> was picked up by others. I've done things like this. Um, no, this is catch cheating stuff. Like it, you don't actually have to be in a cheating class. It's just this person made a spike. Right? I pulled the class wrong. Okay, there's some reason. I got an email this week that said, you're cheating again. I'm like, I'm cheating again because I'm an idiot. I understand that I'm looking dead serious here. And I said, somebody right now pull up your computer and look up, look up a term called dwarf, uh, uh, dwarf spike. Have you looked at this? Because our security cameras are not detected. <laughs> I can do it like once every 15 years. Now it's recorded from the internet. You can't really do it ever again. But yeah, I mean, if I, if you find something like that, or, you know, there was a, there was a thing that happened a few years ago. I'm not going to tell you any names because anybody can find it. But it was in, someone said their rats were at chance. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to describe this room at all. Because I don't actually think this person cheated. I don't think they gave up their data. But they said their rats were at chance. And there was two choices to pass. Except they, the most common, like, no, sorry, no, that's right. But when you looked at the, the variation you should get for random chance, it wasn't there. They were getting either half were getting right and half were getting wrong. So even if the person doesn't know how to make up data properly, which is possible, or more likely, they've got two different subpopulations of rats. The worst part of it was this person kept defending, no, they're a chance, no, they're a chance, and it was a bit of a controversy, uh, which shouldn't have been, because it should have been, yeah, you're right, math doesn't work. 
So they're the same, these sets of numbers, but they're different. Um, they both have the same mean, and they're both symmetrical. But how are they different? Well, we can all see how they're different, that one's more spread out than the other. The top one here is much more spread out than the bottom. There's not going to be any consequences, but I am so disappointed that you take advantage of my disabled ones. God, and I, I, I did go, God damn it, but I turned around and I was like, I said myself, this is so funny. <laughs> the reason I turned around is because I was going to break my, I'm not that good an actor, right? And I hit the wall, it was great. Good moment. Um, there are certain tricks you have up your sleeve as a professor, you do the job long enough, you got little things to do. Switch test, first test. Same as last year's first test, second test, completely different. Then you see the people who just were studying off last year's test, that's hilarious. They just they answered last year's question. Last year's essay question, they didn't even read it. So this is a great answer to last year's question, zero. <laughs> I love doing that. Um, so we kind of talked about spread. So how could we measure spread out in this? So we want to measure stuff, we want to have a number. Um, the range is a start, lowest to highest, and that's obviously where we're going to begin. Okay. Um, 1 to 30 versus 11 to 15, that's the one, that's, that tells us something. The, the first one's much lower than the second one. That's pretty crude, though, isn't it? But it doesn't tell us much. Uh, it tells us something. It has its use, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. We can look at the inner quartile distance, the IQD. Sure, and that's going to give us a little more of a fine grain thing. It's still pretty crude. And in that case, it would just be the second number or the first number or something like that. We're not really setting any limits. Um, we need something better, something that's kind of like the mean. I mean, I know you guys all know what I'm talking about. We need something like the mean. Like the average amount that data are spread out. Yeah, the top set of numbers. So we know the means 13. We're going to take the sum of the numbers minus the average divided by the number of scores. So we got 8 lower minus 8 minus 4 plus 7 plus 17 over 4. It's 0? It doesn't seem right. Well, actually, mathematically, the mathematically sophisticated among you, we are, of course, it's going to be 0. It couldn't be anything but 0. If it was anything <laughs> but 0, we were either in a different universe, or more likely in a mechanical error. So it's, it has to sum to zero. In fact, we'll use that as something, if that's going to be a property we're going to care about in a lot of these things, everything sums to zero. Every equation sums to zero. When you think about it, though, the mean is kind of like the balancing point. We should have just as much on one side as the other. Right? So many times I know what the answer is going to be, and it's not. Um, um, so how do we get rid of those negatives? Because if you got rid of negatives, we could get some to zero, right? Well, the easiest way to do this was to do the absolute value. If you thought in grade nine, grade eight, we told you about What, what, what? 
Um, yeah, absolute value is good. Sure. So let's do that. <laughs> this is actually not bad, right? Because look, we're giving the absolute value. This is, I mean, absolute value is just how much you really get for some zero. For all that, yeah. So that's pretty good. Add them all up, you get 0.8 divided by 5, 9.6. That means it's a number. It's not zero. You can see also that if this was, if these were, and I'm not going to do it for the other numbers, well, I could. Tricky actually in the head, right? Because it's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. One is two, one is three, one is four, and three is six divided by five is 1.2 for the other numbers. Oh, well, it's spread out. Okay. Yeah, that works. But it seems cool, but it's not. Uh, back in the 80s, people wore their hair like that. It's not cool, really. It didn't come right back to it. You ever go to the mall, all you see is people smoking. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, isn't it amazing to actually still see that people are smoking? It's fine. You want to do whatever you want. I, I'm cool with that. It's your life. It's your body. It's whatever. You put. You want to put things in your face and tattoo your eyes. I don't give a shit. You want to wear a mullet. It's great. But you don't mock people that aren't wearing mullets. And I've seen that from people. I've seen two guys, probably about my age. In their high school football champion jackets, 1984. You know those guys? They peaked at 17. And a guy walked by who was really stylish looking. And he looked like he probably was either going to Le Chateau to buy clothes or he worked there. And he was great. So he looked, he looked good. He was dressed nicely. And they were making fun of this guy. Like, this is a person. Like, is he really going to gyms? And it's two guys in sweatpants, high school football jackets that are in their late 40s and have mullets. <laughs> I love this nation mall. Um, it's just a, Maddie and I used to actually take pictures, sir, pictures and take pictures of people's mullets and send them to each other. You ever done that in a long time? <laughs> so for our purpose, this is called the mean absolute deviation, or the MAD. Because it's MAD! MAD, I told you. Mothers against drunk deviation. <laughs> so, it's just not that useful. It has a use, but not in the kind of statistics we will do. Not what I call parametric statistics. In some non parametric, you can still use it in some non parametric ways. So it has a use, it does exist, you can calculate it, but for our purposes, it's kind of a dead end. Okay? So it's a bit of a dead end. It has a really nice intuitive view. It really makes sense. So it's kind of a shame that it's only one step. There must be a better way. <laughs> there must be a better stop, right? Oh, course is over. Uh, so there's got to be some other way we can do this, and there certainly is. The one thing we can do to get rid of negatives, of course, is square the deviation. I know you can never do this. I know I've been slides which is fine I went from the brain I said you can base your slides on this that's fine then he took off and they said it's okay that's fine <laughs> I kind of hope he's listening I really don't think he is and I don't care either but I, I just think it's funny to keep saying that I think it's okay you can only do it for the next couple of years and no one knows who he is and that's why you can't do this he might come back though he might come back Yeah, yeah. Then they make fun of him in Newfoundland, right? <laughs> yeah. So really, it's it's a, it's a victimless crime. You should come right down um, So the negative nine squared becomes eighty-one. We a negative times a negative is a positive. For those of you who are a little confused, it's been a while maybe. It's been that. Okay. So we do that. Getting a little closer here. We're not done yet, obviously. We know that as well. That gives us a number. Gives us a weird number though. It's huge, 112. How many numbers would that give? How could a number that describes a, 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 a batch of numbers be bigger than all the numbers in that batch of numbers? That's not good. Well, it's because it's square roots. So
it's, it's actually really easy. It's a method developed by Isaac Newton. It's Newton's method. It's really pretty easy. You make a guess, you do this linear interpolation in your head. It's not, it's not that hard to do. Wait, so the first thing you have to learn all the squares of numbers from 1 to 25. And then you'd be like, okay, so what would 46 be? Well, it's somewhere between 6 and 7. If, if it's it's going to be 6 point... Point eight something. And that's, for most of your purposes in your life, that's all you need is one decimal place. Like, this is it. But now you have your fancy calculators. You know, calculators now supposed to do it like you know, back in the way we had the internet crap. But anyway, so we take the square root of it. And on that note, we'll stop for now. And uh, we will continue. I think, right? That makes sense. Yeah, 11.50. Yeah. Perfect. We'll stop now and we'll continue talking about the stuff next time. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, this recording. See, that's for the video. This is for the audio. Like I said, I, I need a roadie. I really need a roadie. That's a pretty decent mic. And it looks old timey. I think that's what's the most important thing about it. Uh, right, so we were talking about how, about using spread, and we were talking about measuring it, and we got the idea of squaring the numbers. Of course, 112.4 is a pretty big number. It's squared units, not the original units. So we, the opposite of squaring something is take the square root. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of the number that we ended up with um, when we calculated uh, before. And the original form I was using was sum of the deviations minus the mean squared over the number of observations. Right? So we did that. <coughs> In high school, did he yell in the hall? Um, so, so that was what we had. We think that squared units, let's get it down to unsquared units. We're just going to take the square root of that whole thing. Um, I not connected it. Maybe not. There it goes. Yeah. Um, the formula I've shown you so far, and you know this, it has n on the bottom, and it's actually a problem. You know this from 20 to 26. Um, and I know the n actually makes sense for, I mean, intuitively pleasing for the n to be there, isn't it? But it doesn't, it's not supposed to be there. In fact, it's supposed to be n minus 1. So what we should have done was that. No, what we did do, because intuitively, we're done, done trying to sort of get this from first principles, get this from an intuitive point of view. But, um, this isn't intuitive. <laughs> We want something that will be an unbiased estimator of some quantity in the population. Statistics are numbers that we calculate about that describe samples. We want a param we want to describe or estimate a parameter. Parameters are numbers that describe a population, and they aren't calculated. They're actually characteristics of something. Or they can be calculated, but they're characteristics of something. We want to estimate those things. We really don't care a lot about statistics. We mostly care about parameters. But we can't calculate parameters because we don't have the whole population. Right? We, we can't. So instead, we estimate them with statistics. We want an unbiased estimator. We want something that will overestimate the population in this case, standard deviation, as much as it underestimates the population standard deviation. It's not going to get it right, but we want, to get, we want it to get it wrong. We want it to overestimate as often as it underestimates, and by just as much. Make sense? OK. So the population parameters variance, standard deviation, um, have big N on the bottom. Big N in this case means the total number of observations in the, in, in the population, or the total number of units in the population, whatever you want to say. Okay. But the statistics, the sample statistics, have little n minus 1 on the bottom.
If they had little n, they would actually underestimate the population growth. More often than they overestimate, they would be biased estimators. We want unbiased estimators. Okay, that's what we're looking for: is unbiased estimators. All right. Questions so far? Okay. <coughs> so the sample statistics look like this. A little less squared equals the sum of the x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. The square root of that quantity is a little less. And this is stuff you can learn. <coughs> so, still good? Again, I, I realize this is a review, but it's kind of review from four terms ago, right? Because you could have taken this, you could have taken 21, 26 first term, second year. This is second term, third year. It literally could have been four terms ago. So I understand that it might, it might I, I, I'm you're saying you should know this, you've learned this already, but it was a while ago for some. Again. I took it first year so. Yes, and then that's, that's even further back. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Tom is in here, I know he took it first year so. A while. So if you have any questions, I mean, <coughs> don't feel silly about asking a question, especially that I told you guys this in this class, because if you don't, you'll fall behind if you understand something. Okay. So in our case, you have to write this down. You can, I guess, if you want to, for some kind of person who likes writing down formulas. But, so in our case here, we end up with, if we did this, the standard deviation of 11.85. Right? That's not bad. That, that kind of looks right, doesn't it? You know, when you think about these numbers, 1, 5, 9, 20, and 30, that has an intuitive, that's intuitively pleasing that it will be around 12-ish. And remember, even the, 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 the mean absolute deviation we calculated was like 9.4, is that correct? I think. Um, so that's okay. We got something that, again, the, the, the number it's coming out to is not bad. 11.9. Okay, that's not bad. This is good. It's okay. Now the population. Now note something. In the population, you almost for population parameters, you're almost always going to use Greek letters, not Latin letters. Like in our alphabet's Latin, then we use the Greek letters for, for parameters. Sigma squared. It's a little sigma. That's a capital sigma. I, I know. I know it means summation. The small sigma means variance. So. Thing was it my idea? I didn't do it. I would have made the symbols, you know, perhaps little hockey sticks, something that would be pleasing to me. But it doesn't matter. Big X minus mu squared. Big X. These are that means they're at, with capital X's. They're actual population scores. These are minus mu. This is the actual this is population mean. Okay, and it's n because. We don't have to worry about it being biased in this case because it's the actual thing we're trying to estimate. So remember, if you're doing something for a population, what we believe sometimes, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. But it does happen. If you want to know the average height of students, or sorry, the standard deviation of height of people in this room and no other place, we would use this formula. <coughs> use that formula. But if you're thinking at all that, that this classroom is somehow representative of students at all at this university, or in the world, or in the world, <laughs> you would definitely not use this. So it's under very specific circumstances you use that formula. Now, how are the variance of standard deviation affected by extreme scores? Extreme! I always think of Harold Kumar whenever I the word extreme. So, 159, 20, 30, our standard deviation was 11.85. Right, we just <coughs> calculated that. Okay, let's start with a new number. How about, how about 729? I don't know, I just picked a number. 159, 20, 30, 729. 
Well, our new mean now is 132.33 before it was 13. Got up by back to 10. Wow. And our new variance is, uh, let's see, 85,555.067. I'm not going to go calculate that. I did that with a, well, I did that myself with a calculator. I have a, I had, it's finally broken, a calculator I started graduate school with that calculated variances and standard deviations and had a Z, form, Z table built in and a T table built in. And it cost me $18. It was a beautiful calculator. And then my son broke it. My daughter used it all the way through high school, too. I mean, it's a really, it was, it was not an expensive calculator. It was just perfect. And I bought it literally the first day of graduate school. And I didn't have any money. So the guy who was going to be my TA for my graduate stats class, who I didn't know yet, he was in line behind me. And I had, I had the book. And he said, I'll lend you 20 bucks. What? He said, I'm your TA. And he saw the textbook I had. I paid him back. Just saying. Man of my word. Anyway, you get this, I don't know why I told you that story. Our new standard deviation is 292 and a half. Hmm. Seems to me that the mean and uh, sort of variance uh, in the mean, obviously, are affected by extreme scores. See, the mean's affected by it because in the calculation of the mean, it's the sum of the x's divided by the number of observations. Um, and the mean is actually in this formula. If the mean is in the formula, it's going to also affect this thing. <clears throat> now, can we use this to our advantage somehow? Whoa, that one. Slowly. Fast and slow. Some of these I've ripped, obviously, font changes from other presentations. I lose the ability to care at some point. <laughs> right to the end of the first term. Um, OK. We can, we can actually think about this idea of variation. There's a thing called the coefficient of variation. You don't need to hear about it very much. Uh, this is data from Katz at L1990. So we had two groups of students study. This is real data, by the way. One group st studies, and they get a mean of 69.6. And the other group doesn't study, gets a mean of 46.6. Well, that kind of follows. You'd expect the group that studies does better, of course. You know what's interesting? Look at this. There's more variation in the group that studies than in the group that doesn't study. So there are more pe people do better, go to more extreme, they also go, to, go down more. What? Wait, what? How's that possible? That can't be a thing. How could you do more poorly? How could it be more spread out if people are studying more? Shouldn't their knowledge be more tight? Shouldn't it be like their scores be a little tighter because they're getting to know more? It's counterintuitive, isn't it? It's deviating the standard deviations almost twice this one. Wow. That one and a half, right? That's weird. Well, so we can conclude there's more variation with studying, which would be com which is not only counterintuitive, it just strikes me as wrong. How could that be? How could that be? Well, what you do is if you take this, the standard deviation, and divide it by the mean. What we're doing is we're taking the fact that we're taking the mean into account. We're taking the change in the mean into account. So we're just taking SD divided by mean, and we end up with 0.152 and 0.146. It's co co coefficient of variation. That tells us, in fact, really that the, this, this variation in standard deviations is simply due to the variation in means. Need we compare these using some standardized test? No. There's, there's no need to do some kind of analysis here. Beyond this, this is again an exploratory data analysis rule, or uh, tool, sorry. So <laughs> if these two are roughly the same, we say, oh, I see the variation in variance or standard deviation is simply due to the fact that the means are different. This is just a bigger number. You put a bigger number in here, you're going to end up with a big, what happens when you put a bigger number on top of a fraction? You get a bigger number. That's all that, that, that's what that means. That's what that's doing. That's telling us that. That it's simply due to the fact that with a bigger number, it's had nothing to do with studying causes more variation in scores. Make sense? Kind of neat. <coughs> Data, by the way, collected by a Facebook friend of mine, which is interesting. 
It's great having Facebook sometimes. Other times it's not. Hello? Who is it? Um, I found it yesterday, for example. My brother found it. My brother's, my brother's a record producer. I'm a recording engineer producer. Like, it's a thing. That's what he does for a living. And then someone entered a, a contest on this website that eventually leads to being on an MTV show. And she used a song. She said she wrote it, and she was singing, except she wasn't singing, and she didn't play any of the instruments because my brother played the guitar and the bass. He recorded it in 2007. She said she just wrote it in 2012. She did this with somebody else, too. And it was kind of funny. So I learned all this through Facebook yesterday. And eventually, it turned out she'd done this to many other artists, and this person's career's over. So that was kind of funny. And uh, so seeing that was great. So I saw that on Facebook yesterday. So that was kind of, that had its ups. Facebook can be useful. So it's the same deviation by the It was really hilarious, though, seeing this. At first she was saying, oh, I didn't say I wrote it. You did in this interview. People are stupid. The neat thing is the TV show called the person whose song it was. Like she actually, because they realized that it was fake. Because she submitted a video of herself doing the song, but it wasn't herself. It was this other person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was blonde then. Was her response. And a foot shorter. Right. Yeah, this is a, like like you can get away with that, right? And if you heard my new song London Calling, <laughs> it's just a Clash song. I just play it and say I'm singing. Um. All right. A couple key points. Remember, we want to learn about populations, not samples. We can't calculate population parameters. It would take forever, and by then, every people would have died and stuff. We'd start over. So we have to calculate sample statistics. We estimate population parameters and sample statistics. We want unbiased estimates of parameters. That's what we want. The nice thing is the mean. The, populate, the, the sample mean, x bar, is an unbiased estimator of the population mean, mu. The sample standard deviation with n minus 1 on the bottom is an unbiased estimator of the population standard deviation. Okay. Okay. And before I go on to this, to calculate this score, this gummy bear, what we had is this, this, this point, to calculate S, uh, that's S squared. We had to, it was something we had to do. We had to <coughs> fix the value of the mean. Now, this is, I know that sounds weird. Is it, can you actually calculate the value of the mean? Yeah, but the numbers don't know where they came from. The numbers don't know they were calculated. So we actually fixed this. And let's say there's four numbers to, to make this easy. And let's say the mean is 20. No, sorry. Let's say the mean is 5. And we have four numbers. They have to add up to 20. So we got, we got to add up to 20. So you got like 3 and 7 and 4. And oh, the last one has to be 6. It has to be. So they have to add up to 20 because the mean's going to have to be 5. And the mean's always going to have to be 5. It's whatever the hell it turned out to be. But again, the numbers don't know that we calculated it. So mathematically, we have, we have fixed the value. We have, we have numbers here that are free to vary, and then we have one that isn't free to vary. We have lost what's called literary freedom. So we have numbers that are free to vary. That was three of them. One of them couldn't vary. It was fixed. <coughs> You lose a degree of freedom when you fix a value. And that's what we're dividing by income. Okay. Questions on that? Okay, so the degrees of freedom are just the freedom numbers have to vary. Or they could be the number of values that can be arbitrarily assigned. The definition of degrees of freedom is not n minus 1. All right. Little notation here, the E means expected value. Expected value is just 
the value you would get if you, kept, if you calculated something an infinite number of times. It's kind of like an average. <coughs> so if we've got a, a, a variable x, variable meaning different values, and then we've got a constant k, what's the expected value of x plus k? Well, that's x bar plus k. So the expected value of x is x bar. What's the expected value of x? It's the average of x. Good. What's the expected value of a constant? In other words, what's the average of 10? What kind of question is that? Well, it's always 10. I told you it's a constant. It's going to be 10. So if the average score, let's pretend that I was, I, I don't, when I change grades, which I very rarely do, I've been doing this job long enough that I can design tests that I, I can get nice spreads and nice averages. But let's say it does happen. It hasn't a long time. Let's say I wanted to add 5 to everybody's score and the mean score was 60. What's the new mean? Well, 65. Right? The variance of x plus k. What happens to the variance? So remember, the variance is about how spread out the scores are. Right? So here's how spread out the scores are. There we go. There we go. There's a distribution. I'm going to move them over 5. It doesn't change the variance. Just because I added a value to all of them didn't make them more spread out or less spread out, did it? So the variance of x plus k is a squared sub k, uh, a squared sub x, rather. Does that make sense? Because you have not changed the shape of the distribution and the spread of the distribution if you multi if you add a constant to the distribution. Okay. On the other hand, let's multiply the distribution by something. Let's multiply it by k, a constant. So if we do that, the expected value of x times k is x bar times k. x bar times a constant. Remember, k is a constant. It just means its value doesn't change. x changes. It's, it's, a, it's a variable. Cassie, you look concerned. You okay? Yeah. You're okay a little bit concerned a little, I guess, probably both of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So K would just be like 6? It would be 6. Example, 38. Yeah, it could be anything. Pi. How would you know that it's the constant? Because it's K. Okay. K so is constant. So you think give you K then? Yeah, I mean, it's one of these cases where, for example, if I... And then this is actually how I change rates. I don't ever add constant to rates. Because I don't think it's fair. It's not fair to people. For example, if you got 90, and I add 5 to your score, you know, it doesn't help you as much as somebody at 40. That like, doesn't seem fair to me. I multiply scores times 1. So I multiply times 1.1. 1.1 would be the constant? Okay. Yeah, and 1.1 would be the constant in that case. So if I multiply all the scores times 1.1, and the person at 40 is 44, the person at 90 is 99. Right? It rewards people for doing it better. But it, but it does move the distribution. However, it also spreads it out more because we're multiplying the numbers. So the variance of x times k is s squared times k squared. Now, so this is one of those things, this will happen. You will do this when you're, when you're transforming data, when you're changing data. We'll talk later in the course of when you would do that. There are times when it's perfectly acceptable and reasonable. We transform things all the time. We just change the units of measurement. Think about it. If I, if I had all your heights in inches and multiplied them times 2.54, I've got all your heights in centimeters. <clears throat> the numbers don't know that inches and centimeters measure exactly the same thing. So now you've got a bigger variance, right? Even though your heights haven't changed at all. <coughs> my income in cents is way more impressive than my income in dollars because it's a bigger number. That's all that is. I'm just trying to let you know that that's something that will eventually will come up now and then is that you've just you've changed units. Fahrenheit to Celsius. 
You know, when you're listening to the radio in this city, because we were at a border town, you often hear the, 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 the temperature record, reported both in Fahrenheit and Celsius. You hear it reported in Celsius, the one that everyone in the world uses, and you hear it reported in Fahrenheit, which, which is used in the United States and Liberia. <laughs> That's it. That's it. No one uses Fahrenheit anymore, except in their ovens in North America. Yeah. So weird watching a cooking show or having a cookbook from the UK. And they say, tell, tell your oven up to 108. It's like, that's nothing. 108 <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> it's even better, though, because in the UK they have ovens that just have the gas ovens they have. Just are numbered. Turn your oven up to Mach 4. I don't know what that means. <laughs> What's it go up to? These ovens go to 11. Like, it's really weird. <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, they don't, I don't think those are as common as they used to be, but... But yeah, so we transform things all the time. Whenever that you hear that the, and you know, the transformation that's being done for Fahrenheit is multi Fahrenheit and Celsius is multiply by five ninths and subtract 32. <coughs> that's doing both of them. Right? So we, we do this all the time. So this isn't anything, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that things can happen to, to, to the distributions, but they're still measuring the same thing if you're doing something with a constant. But it will change the shape of it, it will change the, Variance and change the medium. <coughs> yeah, there's a stupid case, the two, two sort of trivial cases. We want the constant is one, or the constant is zero. Right? So the, the trivial case here, if the constant is one, it does nothing. If the constant is zero, then all the scores collapse. But you don't do very often. It's stupid. And multiply all the scores times zero, it looks like everybody's the same. When you're some kind of communist, why don't you go back to Russia? <laughs> I'm glad some of you thought that funny. I did, but um, many of these jokes are just for me, as many of you know. All right, questions on that? <laughs>